Um, well, thank you very much, Alfie. That was very enlightening. I've been wondering for ever since this badge thing got off the ground, and certainly I've followed your work very closely, um, having seen you speak in uh, at Georgia State back in uh, uh, 98. And, um, and so I've been dying to know what your opinion was and what your concerns were about badges. And um, I guess it's, it's, it's pretty much what I expected. Um, you've raised a lot of interesting points. I agree with you. Uh, on quite a few of these points. Um, I've always shared your concern, for example, you didn't talk much today about uh, the, the high stakes testing going on in the schools, but I certainly share those kinds of concerns. Um, and uh, I share your concerns as well with uh, sort of the excessively gamified approaches to using badges, um, sort of the corporatization. Um, but I guess my, my concern is, is that your characterization of badges is sort of just that. There's, there's a lot more going on there uh, than, than, you've, uh, than is represented in, in your arguments. So I'd like to take a second and just back up a little bit and talk just briefly. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned that some of the audience may actually not be familiar uh, with open badges. I know that in my uh, previous work in, in, in Europe and the UK, I've discovered that, that it, it, it's, still, uh, it's, it's, it's still not that well known. So. I want to take a second and just explain partly where the roots and rationale for the open badges initiative and with a particular focus on the open end of open badges. Um, the impetus for, for badges came in part, uh, if you read, for instance, Connie Yowell, who's the program officer at MacArthur, who has, uh, is, is probably the one individual more responsible than anyone for the current open badges movement. Uh, she wrote a very uh, insightful paper back in 99 called uh, Self-Regulation in Democratic Communities that was published in the journal Elementary School Journal. Um, and in it, she wrote what for me was a very, very insightful critique of uh, uh, social cognitive interventions. And she outlined what for me, which was a very helpful vision of a sort of newer view of motivation that embraced the sort of newer situative and sociocultural views that are very uh, influential uh, for many of us, and particularly many of us in the Open Badges movement. Um, I uh, summarized that work in a paper in that same journal in 2003. And so that, that sort of gives me a, being familiar with the theoretical reasoning behind it uh, has really helped me appreciate a lot of the affordances of Open Badges that, that I think you haven't touched on uh, and that aren't represented in your work. In particular, um, there's, there's two points about badges that are worth considering. Um, one is is that open badges make it possible for the issuers of badges to decide, negotiate, to, to study, to, to think about what kind of learning is going to be recognized and how that learning is going to be assessed. And this is one thing that we've seen over and over again. We've just we're just winding down now a study. We've spent two years studying the 30 projects that were awarded funds in 2012 to develop open badge systems. And what we saw over and over again is that organizations had never really given that much thought to what exactly uh, people were learning. They really struggled. And it really was a transformative process for, for, for many of these projects to, to really sit down and say, well, what, what, what are people really learning? What do we value? And how do we assess that? So the, my point here is, is that when you are going to give someone a badge, you're actually making a very interesting decision. You're saying that I'm going to give this badge, and that badge contains information that's going to circulate in social networks. And that is what is fundamentally different about digital badges, is that the expectation is, is that the earners will share their badges out over email, over Facebook, and that information will circulate in social networks of one's peers. And that turns out to be a very, very different thing than anything we've seen before. Students don't tweet their grades, but students do tweet their badges a lot. And, when, and, and so that has a fundamentally different approach to recognition, in my opinion, than anything else we've seen before. So the second point I want to make is that, that Alfie, you, you, you speak for psychologists. You, you refer to psychologists. And, and I'm a psychologist. Um, and there are many aspects of your arguments 
that, that actually I don't agree with, and many of us don't agree with. In particular, the, the fundamental assertion regarding intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Um, for many of us, that's basically a false dichotomy. That that's a problematic starting point to, to divide motivation up in such a sort of straight, you know, that, 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 that. so that distinction isn't very helpful for many of us because many of us now view motivation as really a much more cultural sort of thing, something that is constructed in context and which leads us to the most important point I want to make here, which is that if we want to know where badges work and where they don't work, we need to do the kind of experimentation. We need to uh, find the settings in which badges do foster the things that issuers think are important. Uh, so for example, one of the projects in the UK that people may be familiar with, uh, Supporter to Reporters Network. It's a, a wonderful organization that takes young people and um, engages them in the process of learning to become uh, journalist, sports journalist. And badges play a very central role in that process. And uh, certainly in our studies of it, and anyone who goes and looks at it, it's pretty hard to argue that when someone earns a badge for having done a very sophisticated piece of reporting uh, that one's peers have said, that's really awesome, great job, that one's teachers have gone through and uh, ensured that indeed the student did uh, do a good job, that they did all the work themselves. And that badge, in turn, empowers them to gain access to some new sort of learning opportunity. It's very difficult for us to see how, in any way, that that badge could simultaneously be disempowering that learner. So that's probably the, 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 the most important point I want to make. The first most important point I want to make is, is that we're, we're fairly perplexed by the argument that earning a badge, many of, in many of the projects, the badge itself offers new potential and new opportunity. It's very hard to see how that, that could simultaneously disempower that person. I'd love to hear your response to that one. And the second point I want to make is this. Yes, absolutely, you are right. The overjustification effect, uh, as you've described, starting with, with, with uh, Leper, uh, now we're going almost 40 years, I believe. We've shown this over and over again. You said 100. I think the number is closer to 1,000. Um, but certainly over 100 studies were, um, were sufficiently robust to be included in the meta-analyses conducted in the 90s, which you uh, uh, participated in. So. My supposition is this, that we could replicate every one of those studies with digital badges if we get the exact same results. If we took 100 children in a room, and uh, as the original marker studies did, if we put 100 children in a room and with a bunch of markers and measured their intrinsic motivation for using markers, and then we randomly give half of those kids a certificate, well, if we gave half of those kids a badge that functioned, that had the same function as a certificate, we would find exactly the same result. The question that needs to be asked, though, is if instead of a certificate, uh, there was some sort of a more worthwhile, productive sort of feedback, if, if students were getting feedback for, heck, from an expert on their work, some suggestions from their peers, um, and if that badge said, you know, wow, that's a, you did a great job, you're ready to go on to the next level to um, to enter into an advanced sort of setting where you can gain more, uh, more feedback, more guidance. Um, it's very difficult to see how that kind of a badge would undermine intrinsic motivation. Um, let me look at my notes. Um, so I, probably the biggest concern I have with what you said, Alfie, was uh, this idea of, I'm not sure the words you use, but uh, two of the functions of badges that have been particularly compelling um, is the opportunity, the, the way that they allow learners to find opportunities to learn. Right? If you get into the informal learning spaces where, where badges um, originated from, which was the, uh, if you go to about 2008 and 2009 when the MacArthur Digital Media and Learning Initiative was getting underway, there were all of these innovators, um, folks like Mitch and others who were creating awesome stuff that um, 
learners could seek out on their own and develop skills. Um, well, there was no way for that those accomplishments to be recognized. And so one of the things that badges, the, the impetus behind the badge was quite simply so that when students go off and discover an opportunity to learn something on the web, uh, and they, they do that, well, there, it would be very helpful if there was a way to recognize that learning. And in particular, if there was a way for teachers to recognize that learning. So several of the projects, for instance, uh, the Providence After School Alliance, uh, which is one of the projects we studied, uh, was the only project, actually, that succeeded in allowing students to get school credit for activities accomplished outside of a school setting. And so, so my first point is, is that badges provide this huge opportunity to help learners discover opportunities to learn. And the second concern I have is this concern you have with what we would call stackable credentials where you have a series of badges, small badges, that you then um, uh, you earn these three or four badges. Those might or might not be shared publicly, but those lead up to this sort of big badge, this big accomplishment. But that turns out to be extremely effective in many of these projects for organizing and, and helping students see uh, what they can attain. So I'll stop there and ask you, a uh, Alfie, to respond to those, and I think that uh, uh, we should have some questions coming forward from the audience. Am I to respond now, or, Serge, are we going to questions first? Uh, Alfie, we're, uh, we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience first, and, sure. then, uh, sure. and then we're going to ask to respond, okay? Just give the audience a chance to participate. So, any questions for either the sponsors? Do you want to just, just, just very kind of please? Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Richard. I'm a first trade union in Wales. And you both use two different words. You I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. And you, you have each used, hello, uh, you've each used two different words. Which I think kind of explains your different perspectives. Alfie, you've talked about reward. Daniel, you've talked about recognition. And I think from hearing you both, that's where the divide in your approach or your perspective on badges comes from. What would you say to that? Is that a question to both of them? Yeah, to both. Okay, so Alfie, if you can respond first and then Dan. Uh, recognition is often a reward. What matters is whether it is either intended or construed as an extrinsic motivator and whether it meets the two criteria that I described. Does it cause the task itself to become a means to an end? That end could be a reward or it could be recognition. And does it have the effect of undermining that sense of autonomy because one feels in effect controlled? One can feel controlled by, and sometimes is intended to be controlled by, any extrinsic inducement, not just a dollar or a grade or a pizza, uh, but also a plaque, a certificate, a badge, or praise. So merely using the word recognition uh, doesn't, um, in effect, neutralize the argument or all of the research indicating that any extrinsic inducement can be counterproductive. So, Dan, can you hear me? If yeah, you hear me? Um, I appreciate Alfie's concern. It's a very good point. I know that, that uh, among, certainly among behaviorists, of which, by the way, I am not, I'm definitely not, uh, they make the important point that one has to speak about the actual function of whatever sort of reward is offered. Um, but I do think that the, the larger notion of recognition is important. I think that, that, that simply labeling them a reward right, up, right out of the box sort of makes it problematic. It, 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 it automatically assumes this sort of dichotomy between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, which many of us, as I've said, find problematic and unhelpful.
Don't be shy. Well, yep. Give me a step. Let's see what you come close to it. That way, I do won't rely on you to translate this one. Is the mic back on? Just sit. Yes, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Just sit and. Uh, hi there, both of you. Um, so, my, I think it's fine. Yes, um, my question is about how then do we successfully reward people for being intrinsically motivated to do a task? Um, because it's, and I suppose even as I ask the question, I. I think to myself, sometimes I am, I find myself more motivated to do things than at other times. But, um, yeah, how, that, I suppose that, that's my question. How do we, how do we resolve that? And, and the I'll answer take a is, crack at that. The, the answer is you don't. <laughs> you can't, yeah. by definition. Intrinsic motivation comes from the innate desires of human beings to have basic needs fulfilled, to have a sense of control over one's own self and destiny, to be autonomous, to be connected to others, a sense of belongingness, and to feel competent at personally meaningful things. And here I'm borrowing from the framework of uh, Ed D.C. and Richard Ryan at the University of Rochester. You don't have to create intrinsic motivation. You don't have to try to make people have those needs. When you use certain techniques such as rewards and recognition, or at least recognition of certain kinds, you interfere with the fulfillment of those needs. So our goal is to work with people, students, children, manager, uh, employees, to create a culture, to create a curriculum, to create a series of tasks, to create a climate, in which their desire to learn and accomplish things is allowed to flourish, rather than trying to make them act in a particular way, what I called a doing to model, which is likely to undermine the desire to do those things in the first place. So it's not just that you can't reward people to be intrinsically motivated, and it's not just that it will be counterproductive to do so. It's that you don't need to do so once you understand the nature of intrinsic motivation. So I guess the overall point that I'm offering here is not that open badges are doomed to be doggy biscuits. I don't think they are. And I was careful to say that unlike gamification, I think there's a lot of promise in offering opportunities to learn. So Dan and I are agreed about that. But the extrinsic intrinsic dichotomy, while is actually more nuanced uh, in ways that I'd be happy to talk about, um, nevertheless has stood the test of time in terms of research. Talking about how motivation is constructed in context doesn't at all challenge the fundamental usefulness and research base of the distinction itself. But the key question here is, are we leading people to ask the question, how can I learn more about this and be competent at it and engage with it? Or are we leading them to ask the question, what do I have to do to get another badge? And the more the latter question rises, the more damage we're doing to both competence and intrinsic motivation. So um, my thinking about this topic is shaped a lot by uh, the psychologist uh, uh, Carl Breiter and Marlene Scartamalia. In 1989, they wrote a, a very influential paper on the notion of intentional learning. And they make the distinction between learning as problem solving and learning through problem solving. And they make the very important point that the, that's a big difference. It's, it's not a nuanced difference. If your goal, if, if the problem you're trying to solve is your lack of knowledge about something, it's a very, very different learning environment than if you're asking students to solve problems in order to help them learn something. 
and they make the key point in there that shaped my thinking over the past really you know 30 years that that the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is simply too crude to advance our thinking about this notion of intentional learning so in my own classes for example where I've been able to really um, really uh, push I think the limits or to push our thinking about badges one of the things one of the competitive badges one of the badges that you only a few people can earn because their peers have deemed their work to be exemplary. Uh, that badge is awarded for what we call productive disciplinary engagement. First and foremost, in my world, what I want people doing is to be engaging with the ideas, the terms, the concepts of the discipline in which they're learning. So, in my case, this is educational assessment. So, uh, we've I think we've been quite successful at, at uh, having a different version of a badge, a so-called leader version of a badge that is earned, that can earn only be awarded to the students whose peers have said, yes, we think your work is exemplary in terms of the way that you're engaging with disciplinary knowledge. And in particular, what I want students to learn is how their own interests and experience and goals shape the ideas that they're learning in my class. And so I find badges to be quite an effective way of uh, making it clear to students why that's valued. I don't see any evidence that competition around that is undermining people's engagement in it. So I, I don't, I, I'm quite comfortable with the idea that, that we are rewarding not intrinsic motivation. I agree if you buy into the intrinsic extrinsic dichotomy then Alfie's absolutely right. <laughs> There's simply no way around it. The very definition of intrinsic motivation means that you can't reward or recognize your way to it. But if you pri if your priority, as is, is in the case for many of us, is on this notion of disciplinary engagement and productive forms of disciplinary engagement, then yes, you can recognize it and you can reward it and you can get more of it. Over. I guess I'm having trouble here because I have no problem with the concept of disciplinary engagement or with the distinction regarding problem solving. Those make perfect sense to me. But in no way does embracing or endorsing those concepts undermine the usefulness and the research support for the intrinsic-extrinsic distinction. Now, it's not to say it's all or nothing. I think many people in many situations have elements of intrinsic and extrinsic. But that fact, too, doesn't mean that the terms are meaningless uh, or, or useless. I guess the argument is the more we lead people to think of things, including badges, as extrinsic rewards, the more damage is done. So it's not all or nothing. And that would be true for disciplinary engagement, which itself, I would predict, would be powerfully undermined by getting people uh, to think about what am I going to get for this? Or worse, what am I going to get at the expense of everyone else who can't? So making kids your accomplices by having them vote on who gets this award in no way um, mitigates the destructive effects of its being not only a reward, but an award. Can some kids feel good about this? That was a question you raised earlier, Dan, about you, you can't see how it can be disempowering. Well, that gets us to the heart of what it means uh, to be empowered, which in turn raises the question of the nature of autonomy. I've seen plenty of kids, for example, who are in awful reading incentive programs where they get points or levels or pizza parties or prizes of various kinds for reading books. And these little kids are bragging about it. They might tweet about it. And they often do tweet about good grades, which makes my heart sink not just about open badges. So we wouldn't want to rest our case for open badges on the fact that kids don't brag about other doggy biscuits. They do. But I've seen kids get very excited about some extrinsic uh, uh, goodie they got for reading books. Yay, look how great I am. How can I get more of these? But these kids, in a fundamental sense, are being lost as learners because their desire to do the learning itself the productive engagement with the problems, for example, or their interest in reading for its own sake is evaporating before our eyes. The fact that they show the superficial appearance of empowerment 
meaning they're pleased with themselves for getting another doggy biscuit, in no way contradicts all of the research demonstrating the hidden, as well as not so hidden, long-term effects of treating people this way. And so that's why I'd say, please apply at least some of the criteria that I've suggested today for deciding whether open badges are likely to be a net positive or negative, or are likely to make them more constructive or destructive. You know, the extent to which there's ever a situation where people are set against each other with mutually exclusive goal attainment, only one of us can get this distinction. Or, as I said before, the extent to which kids' question is not about the task itself, but about levels of achievement and recognition. What do I have to do to get a badge means intrinsic motivation, or if you want another term, disposition to learn may be diminishing. Uh, one point I want to make, Alfie, going back to your point earlier, that a lot of people aren't aware of is that, that because of the restrictions on uh, age, particularly in the U.S., um, the whole open badges is pretty much focused on kids 13 and up. None of the project we've studied, um, right, because you, you, they're issued according to an email address. And so I think it is worth pointing out that, that, that almost all of the projects involving open badges currently are working with, with people ages 13 and up. Which leads me to, so the, there's three points that, that you have concluded that, uh, three cautions that you have raised, which pretty much undermines or guts the entire logic behind badges. One is this idea of these stackable credentials, that you would earn a series of badges, that the badges lay out a pathway, to use Nicole Pinkard's term. Uh, many students find this very helpful. Here's a pathway of, of things that I can engage in. Um, it's a mistake to label that a competency-based approach. That is not necessarily the case, that it's a series of discrete skills. Those badges can be a series of accomplishments that, that can bundle or, or, or lead to a bigger recognition, and, and those badges serve a very important function in that regard. The other caution that you have raised is, again, about sharing this information publicly. That is a huge... Uh, advantage of badges. Uh, Philip Schmidt at Peer-to-Peer -peer University, who provided much of the original sort of guts and thinking about this, made the point early on in this endeavor. He said that, you know, it, it's kind of one thing when, right, in P2PU is this open university, this university in the cloud. So, okay, it's one thing when uh, individuals get together and decide what the criteria for a badge is going to be. It's another thing when you have a machine a computer, uh, some sort of system coming up with the criteria. But it's a whole different ball of wax when you have a community coming together to decide what the criteria is that the machine will issue a badge. You're creating an entire ecosystem of learning of the likes of which we've never seen before. My concern with your concerns, Alfie, is, is that uh, if we take your cautions to heart, uh, much of this innovation simply doesn't get off the ground because it would be impossible to build the kinds of badging ecosystems that we're seeing across the projects that we've studied. Um, they do make badges public. They do use stackable credentials. So I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, I have nothing invested in the continuation of the open badges movement, even though I'm open to it's being done the right way, in my view, what constitutes the right way, if that's possible. If it turns out that in order to execute it according to the plan that people had in mind, it runs afoul of these important caveats, uh, then I'm happy to say, let's try something else. But I, I don't prejudge whether that's true. For example, I don't know whether you're right when you say either uh, individual badges have to be made public, otherwise you can't have an ecosystem of people discovering, discovering that together. I don't know if that's true. Maybe we can have that ecosystem of people uh, collaborating um, to figure out what the criteria are for the badges and then keep private whether I've earned one today. So that doesn't have to be shared. But make no mistake, once it's public, it turns into a contest and you're going to have people quite naturally becoming part of the system where it's, I've got more than you. And that's even worse than the salience and the extrinsic nature of the badges that's likely to happen when they're stackable. So we're going to pause.
pause here and take a question from the audience. Sina? Hi, hi, thanks. Um, I'd like to just get back to the nature of the rewards um, rather than the badge technology itself, because it seems to me the badge, the technology itself is often a distraction because it can be used in a number of different ways, positive or negative. But whether you call it intrinsic or, in, or, or extrinsic, um, the kind of rewards that I would be interested in to bring about the kind of culture and society that I would really like living in would be the reward of gaining appreciation from a range of trusted or respected peers. Or maybe to begin with in earlier children, gaining appreciation or positive feedback from valued or attached adults. Now, what, I mean, I, I don't know whether you want to classify that, probably not, as intrinsic or intrinsic. But you know, do you think that actually, concentrating on that kind of reward, do you think that would actually help, um, uh, help to have some clarity or drive, put in some middle ground here? And, and, and I, I, I guess. I think it's an interesting question. It depends on... ...or intrinsic, but something actually valued in a kind of society which we would actually appreciate living in, rather than being uh, competitive and, and, and um, uh, di uh, divisive. Let's make a distinction between getting feedback from, which feedback means information, from others, adults, if you're a child, and also peers. And on the other hand, getting approval or recognition from those people such that that approval and recognition becomes the reason why I engage or continue to engage in the task. I don't want my kids to learn, spend more time on academics in school so that the teacher will approve of them and say, good job. I like how hard you're working. I really appreciate that any more than I want them to do it for grades or money. In other words... But, but, but sorry, sorry, that is a lie. They don't really appreciate it. They're saying that as a, as a didactic agent. No, no. I, I agree with you that that sometimes happens, and they're lying and saying, I like the way that Peter is sitting so nice. At, right. I agree. I think you agree. That's manipulative. That's false. We don't want that, right? We, we want, I'm saying that it's really... Okay. My point is, even when they've met that first criteria and it's genuine, it's authentic, it's not just a Skinnerian device to manipulate behavior, they really do appreciate and like what the kid has done, it can still undermine intrinsic motivation if, from the student's point of view, this is now a major reason why I'm doing it. So the fact that it's the person meant it, or there's something authentic about it, and that includes the other kids voting me most improved or something, and they, they mean it, that doesn't uh, leave us in the clear, because there can still be a damaging effect both on the quality of performance and an intrinsic desire to persist at it. So once again, introducing the phrases that you have, which I think raise important ideas about my connection with my peers and with adults, doesn't negate the fundamental fact that once I construe something as an extrinsic inducement, it has enormous power to do harm. We can't define or wish that fact away. That's why we have to be so careful with this. Can I respond to that? So I'd just like to say, um, yeah, this, this uh, in fact, one of the uh, key principles that we uncovered across our projects is this uh, recognition from peers and trusted peers and from authoritative experts. Um, and so the, the, I, I believe that if we took Alfie's concerns to heart, we wouldn't even go there. We wouldn't even try that. And so for my money, that's a good example of the, the argument that, that Really, I've been making from the start of this that, that I, 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 I am concerned about many of the use of open badges, but uh, what is particularly appealing to me about badges is that they're going to allow some and force other to transcend what for me are very, very outdated notions of learning, of motivation, of engagement. Uh, we've come a long ways, uh, certainly in the past 30 years, 
Um, and the arguments, this, 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 especially the DC and Ryan characterization in these uh, purely constructivist models of learning, um, we know a lot more about learning. We've, we've, you know, Alfie speaks for psychologists as a whole, but in fact, he speaks for a very specific, a, a particular set of psychologists about these concerns. There's a, a lot of us out there that think about learning as a much more cultural and a much more uh, social uh, way than is implicit in Alfie's work, and we don't take that for granted. We we recognize that we're making those assumptions. And that's what's exciting to me about open badges is that we can say, well, let's let's not assume that these things are true, and let's see where that takes us. Um, let me be clear that the notion of psychology on which I'm, I'm I'm basing this stuff is very much up to date and concerned about social and cultural dimensions. That's sort of a straw man. This isn't trapped in research that was only done 40 years ago or purely individualistic. In fact. The notion, the, the need for belongingness as part of a, a social uh, dimension of psychological motivation is built into the original model. I guess I don't start this out. My point of departure isn't to say, if we take these concerns seriously, open badges is in trouble. Therefore, let's figure out a way not to have to take these concerns seriously. Rather, I start by saying, these are really important data and theory-based objections. If we can find a way not to run afoul of them, terrific. If we can't, then we have to go where the theory and data lead. OK, so we're going to take another question from the audience. Thank you. Um, hi, Alfie and Dan. I'm Susan Kahn. I'm from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. And I want to change the subject just a little bit to higher education. Um, Alfie, you've talked a lot about how extrinsic rewards that destroy intrinsic motivation. Um, and I can imagine that over the course of uh, 13 or 15 years of schooling, uh, students may lose much of that in intrinsic motivation that they originally have. Um, so I'm wondering now about the implications for us in higher education. When we get those students, um, some are intrinsically motivated to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, some are not. In effect, they're coming to us with their intrinsic motivation pre-destroyed um, in terms of the way you explained it. So what do we do to try to re resurrect that intrinsic motivation? This is one of the greatest frustrations, I think, of, of higher education faculty throughout our colleges right. and universities uh, in the US. What, what can we do with those students who come through that system? Let me start by saying I wish more people in higher ed were even asking this question, um, which I think is an important question to ask. For Instead of complaining about grade inflation, you know, when the problem is not grade inflation, the problem is grades, for example. Uh, or a number of people across fields in higher ed, some of them even in the field of psychology, um, who just talk about motivation as if it were a unitary phenomenon. And therefore, if we have a, if the midterm counts for more in my class, they'll be more motivated to study, even though what they're doing is compounding the difficulty of what has been done to these students to begin with. My answer to you in, in a few sentences would look like this, I think. First, Bring students in on the process of talking about exactly these issues. You can't just yank the grades or the badges or the recognition or, or the other rewards away from them and expect them to say, hooray, finally, we can be intrinsically motivated. First, uh, they won't do that because you've done this shift to them. First, you did rewards to them. Now you're doing the abolition of rewards to them. It has to be a collaborative, possibly gradual approach that's more about what I call working with than doing to. Um, second, the absence of extrinsic motivators, and I appreciate your question giving me the chance to make this point if I wasn't clear, is necessary but not sufficient for intrinsic motivation. You have to do probably a lot of the good deep pedagogy that Dan was alluding to. Um, and that a lot of people have been talking about where students are understanding ideas from the inside out, 
Rather than memorizing facts and practicing skills, the assessment has to be done authentically, probably not involving tests. Um, students have to have more of a role in deciding on the curriculum, negotiating it with the instructor, rather than the instructor sending out a syllabus on the first day of class saying, doesn't matter who you are, what you know, or what you need, this is the class I'm going to do to you, regardless of who you are. It's a remarkable when you find this kind of thing happening in a, in a higher ed classroom when the instructor is willing to give up some control. So the way we resurrect or revive intrinsic motivation begins by getting rid of the stuff that kills it. Any kind of competition in a classroom, um, excessive control, grades, and other rewards. But it proceeds to do a lot of other kind of exciting teaching where the students are learning with and from one another, and where many of the decisions are made collaboratively in the classroom. I recently stumbled across an old book I'd never seen before called How to Teach with Your Mouth Shut by a guy named Finkel, I think is the name, which is a wonderful example of what amazing teaching can look like in a higher ed classroom that doesn't just get rid of grades, and by the way, there are some universities and colleges that don't use grades at all because they, they want to create a learning-oriented environment rather than a grades-oriented environment. But where in individual classrooms, you've got people who have been invited to think about how learning is happening, as opposed to what I think you and I would have to admit, sadly, is true, that the vast majority of university professors really have never been invited to think much about pedagogy. Many of them are not particularly good at it. They've never been in remarkably good classrooms. They think of themselves as experts in literature or history or chemistry or whatever or psychology. And so they just transmit a bunch of facts and test students and wonder why the kids are still extrinsically motivated. Uh, do I, is there time for me to respond to this question? can respond briefly and then uh, just uh, some quick okay. closing remarks. Hi, Susan. Nice to see you again. Um, so, yeah, so, so one of the big principles in much of my work in higher education is around this issue of what do we do with portfolios. And since this is a portfolio-oriented meeting, um, I guess I want to make the point, one of the, one of the key principles in this model that I've been refining called participatory learning and assessment is that uh, you really run the risk when you try to make claims about enduring knowledge from student-generated artifacts. Alfie, your, your solution to many of the assessment problems and this, 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 you know, this concern over classroom accountability that basically is never going to go away. Um, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental part of formal education. My advice when it comes to the kinds of things that Susan is asking about in sort of a, an artifact-centric classroom is, is that wherever possible, actually, we should not be evaluating student-generated artifacts for evidence of enduring understanding. We should evaluate artifacts in terms of students' engagement uh, in those artifacts. But all of the kinds of lovely interaction and learning and feedback and all this informal stuff that can happen around artifacts, what I've seen over and over again is it gets destroyed when those artifacts are evaluated for typical classroom accountability purposes. And we're not going to wish that away. So what I'm going to suggest to everyone there is that you think hard about bracketing your portfolio activities with high quality classroom assessments that, that give you some confidence and the learner's confidence that indeed students can use uh, the ideas that, that have taken shape in developing a portfolio of some sort in some new setting. Um, and, and don't put so, don't rely so much on the artifacts themselves because doing so really destroys the sort of engagement and participation that uh, artifacts actually can foster in higher education. Great, Dan. Thank you. Uh, maybe just some closing remarks from Alfie. Um, you know what? I'll skip it. I think I've said my point and in some cases said some of the things a couple of times. So I appreciate the chance to offer these cautions and questions um, to see if it's possible. And I think it's an interesting challenge to, to see if the idea of open badges, which has a number of lovely ideas uh, and desires uh, behind it, can be rescued 
without them turning into something that we already know uh, makes uh, does more harm than good. I hope so. But if not, then let's go where the evidence and experience leads us. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. I've, I've certainly learned a lot. From thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Great. So we'll uh, stop the recording there and say thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Nice bye. to meet you, Alfie. You too. <laughs>